Welcome to today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light. Sun, Salt, and Light, S-O-N, knowing and growing in your daily relationship with Jesus Christ, but also being the salt and the light in your marriage, in your family, at your place of work, at your church, and even in the community you're in. I'm Pastor Michael Petit. This is a radio ministry of our church, Calvary Chapel Divine, here in Divine, Texas. We are so glad that you joined us for today's broadcast. We are a Calvary Chapel, so we simply teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We believe that God uses His Word to transform, restore, and to change lives one verse at a time. If you're visiting our area, you'd like to get information about our church or church service times, maybe even track down some of the other teachings that we have available through podcasts, whether it's through Audible or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can do all of that at our church website at calvarydivine.org. That's calvarydivine.org. So last week we actually looked at the division that was happening between Lot's herdsmen and Abram's herdsmen, right? And, and so one of the things that we learned last week was that we learned that Lot was a peace, or Abram was a peacemaker, right? Abram looked to resolve the problem, and that's what a leader should try to do, is we look to try to resolve the problem. And, and we also saw that he wasn't perfect. We saw that, that he asked his wife to lie, like tell them you're, you're my sister because they're going to try to take you, and then they'll just kill me. And so he's like, please lie. And sure enough, she lies and he lies. And the Pharaoh takes, the, uh, uh, takes her and is going to marry her. And yet she's already married. But then a plague comes. And, uh, and unfortunately, the plague comes and, and um, uh, the Pharaoh's like, you, I don't know what you brought on me, but you got to go. And so he gets them out of there. And, and, and it's a reminder, too, how quickly that even as followers of God, that we can be caught up in something, thinking this is the right way of doing it. We talked about lying as we were in the book of Ephesians. And, um, and we have to be careful not to be uh, trying to set ourselves up thinking, well, this is the best way to handle this. Maybe if I don't tell the whole truth, this is how I should do it. And it's not the way that we should be doing things. And so, again, this is the beauty of Scripture as you see humanity. Uh, Abram is no different than Israel. Israel is no different than us. We fall and we do things and we fall into sin. And, and so it, it is a reminder to us that, that we are to be walking with God and there's obedience when we do it. But when we don't do it, don't be surprised when something happens and God exposes it. He's not going to allow you just to keep doing it. And Abram had it. It was exposed. His lie was exposed. And so was Sarah's because she was complicit. She was complicit. Then we saw as they took care of this dispute between Lot and Abram that Lot desired the fleshly things of the world. He saw that it was good. He saw the fertile land and, and all of that uh, area. And he's thinking to himself, this is exactly where I need to be. But eventually he starts to move towards Sodom. He starts to move towards Sodom. And then now what we get into as we head into Genesis 14, we actually have the first war that's mentioned in Scripture. And this is a war, you know, if we look at it during this time, it would have been a, 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 a battle of the world. Kings versus kings. Five kings versus four kings. Right? And these kings were actually trying to charge them into to paying tribute. Or every time they try to move across land areas, they would need to pay or give up some of the, the money. Uh, or either some of the um, the the... Uh, the, the, the stock of what they had at the time of their, their goods. And, and so what we see is we see that now we have these kings battling and what happens is they finally get fed up with it. And they're like, we're not paying it no more. 
And it went on for a year. And then now what we enter into is we enter into the beginning of the war. And that's what we see. And now I'll be very honest with you. There are some names in here I am... I have worked on, and I know you're probably going to look at me and going, "What? I don't know what you're saying. I have gone through Blue Letter Bible time and time again, listening to it and listening to it and listening to it. And then the sad thing is, is I have to try to put it into my way I pronounce things. So just bear with me as we go through this, okay? There will, I will be stopping on certain points because the names of the kings are very important. Some of the names of the kings are very important. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king, and, and Amraphel is actually is the king of Babylon. So he is actually, what, that, what Amraphel means is actually sayer of darkness. And what is Babylon, what, are, what is being practiced today? Babylonian traditions, which is darkness. It still is happening today. And here we have the king of the Babylonians at the time. King Shinar, Adyok, King of Eleazar, Kedor Lemur, uh, the, this was the Persian king, and his, that actually meant a handful of sheaves, knives, ready to, ready to go. And if you think about the Persian area, this hasn't changed. They're ready to fight in a moment's notice. They fight over land, and it's a mess over there. And, and so then it has uh, King of Elam and King of Tadal. Uh, he was an ally of the Persian. And yes, it is T Tadal, not like the, uh, like the hip-hop Tadal. Like I kept thinking, that I can't get out of that. But that's how you say it, Tadal. And so he was actually, he was an ally of the Persians. Uh, and he was part of the King of Nations. They made war, and this is who they make war with. They made war with Bera, King of Sodom. Sodom actually in Hebrew means burning, which is gonna what's gonna happen to Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And so that means burning. And so uh, the Bera, the king of Sodom, uh, Bereshia, king of Gomorrah, and Gomorrah actually means iniquity, iniquity to transgress against God, burning and iniquity. He's, God's going to deal with both Sodom and Gomorrah as we get further down into the chapters. And then Shanab, king of Admon, Shamabar, king of uh, Zabalim, and that was the one I thought I was going to mess up on the most. And I messed up on the other one. And the king of Bela, th that is Zor, and, and all these joined together in the valley of Sedim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedalamor, and in the 13th year they rebelled. In the 14th year, Kedalamor, the king that were in him, came and attacked uh, Raphaims, uh, uh, and this one's going to be rough, Ashtaruth, Kaninhim, and Zeusims, and Ham. Then Amim, Shadakil, Eth, and the Horites in the mountain of Sir. We're almost done with it. As far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in uh, Hazazan Tamor, and the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Edmon, the king of Zabaim, uh, the king of Bela. Uh, went out and joined together in the battle in the valley of Sedim against Kedalamor, uh, king of uh, Elam, Tadal, uh, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinor, and er Erdok, king of Eleazar, four kings against five. All right, so we survived that, right? Praise God for that, okay? So what you have, and I know that's a lot of names, and, and it's very detailed. This is the first war of wars. You know, they, you have a war that's going on between these five kings, five kings versus four kings, and they had stopped paying tribute. You also find out that, that we see in Sodom was the group of the smaller cities, 
And they were part of the, the, the group out of the Dead Sea. And, and when they stopped paying, it was for 12 years. The, the, um, uh, they decided to stop paying for 12 years. So they, they just decided we're done. We're throwing off the shackles. We're not doing this anymore. And, 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 it, and it is a revolt. It's a rebellion. And it, there's a, an economic result to this as well. So they're, 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 they're having to do something because economically it's affecting them. They can't keep paying this tribute. So they just decide we're not doing it anymore. We might as well go to war. But the thing that you need to catch out of this is one thing that's very important is what? Did you hear Abram's name mentioned? Not at one time. It, uh, the world is at war and Abram's not even doesn't affect him because he's protected and, and he's being he's in what? He's in obedience with God. He did what was right with him and Lot. You go left, I go right. Whatever, whatever you need, Lot, you, you pick it and I'll do the other opposite. He's doing what God had called him to be as a peacemaker and yet he's not affected by the war. It's important for us to understand the reason why we're going through so much is because we are a nation who's running from God. Okay? We're a nation running from God. And the more that we run from God, the more chaos that we'll see in our world in the United States. And, and it's important for us to catch that. These are real places. So when we look at K. K. Little more, uh, that is actually Iran. That's actually Iran. Uh, Amraphel is actually Iraq. And then Tadal and Adok is the actual, the kings were modern day Turkey. These are real, real places, real people. And we've told you all that over time that you have to, when you study the Bible, you see that these wars happened in Iraq, Iran. Uh, they were modern day Turkey, a lot of the same area that we still fight over today. Right? A lot of the same stuff that we still fight over today. Uh, archaeologist Nelson Gluck documented the destruction. He, he said by this, I found that every village, this is about these kings after the war, I found that every village in, the, in their path had been plundered and left in ruins and the countryside was laid waste. The population had been wiped out or led away into captivity. Four hundreds of years, therefore, the entire sea area uh, was abandoned like a cemetery. Unkept with all the monuments shattered and strewn into into pieces on the ground. That's what war does. It swept through the valley as they conquered it. And now we see in verse ten it says, Now the valley of Sodom was full of asphalt pits, and the king of Sodom uh, king of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there and remain and the remainder fled to the mountains. So uh has anybody ever seen, I, I think we'll have one or two that has, seen the tar pits in L.A.? Okay, this is what this would be. All right, these are, when they talk about asphalt pits, they're like tar pits. But what happens, just like divine, right, gets real dusty, right? What happens is all that dust blows in, and it looks like ground, and you step in, and you're into a tar pit. So they would have known where this tar pit, where the asphalt area was. But what happened is the wind blows in. They can't see it. They can't remember. They go right into. And once you go in, you ain't coming out. You're dead. So it's, that's, that's what's happening. So th and then the remainder of them fled to the mountains. So the, the kings, you know, the four kings knew the area better. So, but... Un unfortunately what ends up happening is a lot of them died in the asphalt pits they all did because it just like we see here today it's you know you get that dust that blows in it covers the, the, the tar up you don't see it and you just walk right into it and so it's uh, one of those things that uh, just just to know then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their possession, uh, provisions and they, and they went their way they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. So now we got a problem. 
Where is, so uh, where is Lot now? He dwelt in Sodom. So he saw it. And then he goes to it. But then he pitches a tent even closer to it. And then he eventually ends up in Sodom. Now Sodom's a real place. Sodom and Gomorrah, is, they, they have evidence. Biblical archaeology has found that there is evidence of the... Um, uh, when Sodom and Gomorrah, when it rained fire down, it, they had the evidence there. It's, it, it, and it's in the area of the Dead Sea, exactly where the Bible says. Sometimes we try to overthink things, or we try, but the Bible is pretty clear. And, and do you realize that most biblical archaeology begins with the Bible? But most archaeology before the 70s begin with what the Bible said. So if the Bible said that this was modern day or, or this was Iraq, they were able to start looking in that area for that city to try to find evidence of that king. Or they would look for evidence of Sodom and Gomorrah. They found it. Where is it at? Near the Dead Sea. It's in the Bible. You don't have to overthink it. And, and that's very important because when we get to Melchizedek, there's too much arguing of theology over that. And it's very simple. And we'll get, when we get to it, it's very, very important that we don't try to overthink the theology of it. Because all you're doing is arguing theology. You know, people argue whether it's a Christophany. This is a moment where Christ shows up in the Bible. But there are things that point to it that say that it's not. In the book of Hebrews. But there's a very important significance of Melchizedek because he's, he's in the Old Testament and New Testament. And we'll look at all that next week. It's very important that we understand that. But let's go by what the Bible says. That's, that's where you start. <laughs> it's, this is your foundation. You know, we, we start with the context of Scripture. What does the context of Scripture give us? And that's our evidence, right? Right? But one of the biggest things that we get from this is we find out that Lot's, all his possessions, all everything's gone. The provisions of Sodom and Gomorrah are gone. But we find out that Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom, Lot, and his goods and departed. He's lost everything. He was just in chapter 13 with all this stuff. And it's gone. It's gone that quickly. And, and so sin is, and this is very important as we look at Lot's movement into Sodom, it's very important that we look at our own lives to make sure that we're not creeping into sin either. Because it, it will cost you everything. We see in Genesis thirteen twelve, it said, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So he goes from seeing the fertile land, this is where I need to be, to the point where he's hearing what's happening in Sodom, so where I'm going to pitch my tent near the city. And now he's living in the city. There's a progression of sin that's happened here. It's, it's sad because we, we, we see the, the, the wickedness that we know that becomes Sodom and Gomorrah. And ends up costing his wife life. And, and, and now he's living in Sodom. And you've got to wonder too because Abram built altars to worship God. Where is Lot's altars? Oh, that's just something my uncle did. That's, that's not me. Well, that's his God. I, I, I was just along for the ride. And that's, that's what happens with a lot of people. A lot of people know God, but they don't, they don't know God in a relationship. They haven't chosen to follow him. And then we have some that know God, and they've allowed compromises in their life. And before you know it, you're living in Sodom. And you've got to be careful with, with your sin. 
So what are some things that we need to look out for when we think about Lot's, Lot's life and the reality of sin and the consequence and the stages of his sin? Well, first, we need to be mindful and catch the progression of sin early. You need to catch it early. Because what happens if you don't catch it early, one day you'll wake up and you're actually in Sodom. You're knee-deep in the sin already. And you've been given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to confess it, repent, and walk away from it. But you, again, red light, green light, you're just red light and you're passing it. Red light, passing it. The Holy Spirit's just on you. Remember we talked about the darkening uh, and the drifting that happens. And that's what happens with Lot. He just drifts away. He just drifts away. And he never intended to do that. Right? Nobody ever intends to fall into sin. Does something that brings pleasure to them for a momentary moment, like it's, and then it, it flees. And a lot of people, whether you do addictions or, or you look at addictions, it's a, it's you always have to like. I, you ever met anybody like uh, they started with weed, and now they're doing stronger stuff. Because the weed's not working anymore. But today's weed, Lord, it's completely different than what it used to be back in the 60s. I mean, today's weed, they're actually creating addicts with how strong it is. They had a study that was done. Y'all need to look that up because that would blow your mind. There was a study that was done uh, in Denver. I think it was in Colorado. And in California, the, the TCH levels are so high that they're creating addicts and when they come off of it they're having schizophrenia it's a high number and you go well I just wanted to get high one time it, it's you know but again what ends up happening is you allow something into your life and it ends up becoming something that begins to to own your life James chapter 1 verses 14 through 15 says but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed then when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death that word entice that's listed there actually means in the greek that it's like a, a bait being trapped right it's 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 like setting the trap for the mouse and you keep thinking you can get the cheese out and sometimes you get mouse that can get the cheese, right? But eventually, they don't. Maybe they get too fat because they've been eating so much cheese and eventually they miss it and get caught. That's what sin is. It brings death. It entices you. It brings death. But it's like, I love what it says there. It's like when, and, and you can put it that way, when he or she is drawn away by his own desires and is enticed. You allow yourself to do it. You start convincing yourself, hey, this maybe I just for, I've had a really bad day. Right? I've had a really bad day. Get the bourbon. Next thing you know, the bottle's gone. And then the next day, you like, okay, get the bourbon again. <laughs> you start going right into it. And all it took was that one bad day and you let, allowed that desire to be filled. And so we have to be very careful with that. And Charles Spurgeon says this, if you're not going to be saved, be saved 100%. Right? So what he's saying is the most miserable person in the world is actually someone who's a half-hearted Christian. Meaning they have one foot in the world and one foot trying to follow Jesus. He goes, they're miserable. Because they, they can't get enough of the world and they can't get enough of God. They're chasing after both. Your heart is filled with salt and not in a good way. You feel dry and lifeless in every area. You're straddled between two opinions of the world, the sin, and trying to follow God. And you can't do both. John chapter 8, verse 34 says this, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. 
you become a slave to it. And, and it's important for us to see. Lot became a slave to sin. He started chasing after Sodom. The other thing we do is, do you not believe that God will judge? You allow your sin to continue, keep creeping along with your sin, but you think God's never going to judge you. I've been getting away with it for some time now. And nothing's happened. Be careful. Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 13. Then the man said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? And the son of all your sons, your daughters, and whoever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Like Lot, you want to stay here in your sin? Go ahead. And guess what? Not all the family goes. Not all the family goes. Your sin has consequences. And God is going to execute judgment. At some point, you think you're getting away with it. Jonathan Edwards says this. He was an 18th century American theologian. I love what he says. And he was teaching on hell. Something that pastors have gotten away from. Imagine yourself cast into a fiery oven. Glowing with heat. And imagine that your body was going to lie there for a quarter of an hour. Full of fire. Inside and out. Feeling every fiber of it the whole time. What a horror it would feel at the entrance of the, the, such a furnace. And how long would that quarter of an hour seem to you? But what if you knew you must lie there and endure it for another full 24 hours? Staring at the entrance of the furnace as you're surrounded by fire. But wouldn't your heart sink even if you knew that you must bear it forever and ever and ever and eternity? And so it's an hypocrisy uh, to say that that you believe that that as we look at this that that you believe in heaven and hell and you don't you're not doing anything you can to keep keep those that you care about from going there like if you see somebody going into sin lot abram will see steps in in joel chapter 2 verse 13 it says so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For He is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and of great kindness. And He relents from doing harm. The only reason you may not have been judged tonight. Is because He is merciful and gracious and slow to anger. But don't think that all your stuff will be put into the light. It will be. It will be. You think you're getting away with something and it's exposed. And it's devastating. It's devastating when you have that happen and it's a family member or somebody that you love and you're blown away. How long this has been going on? You got to wake up to that stuff. You need to deal with that sin. Don't let it drag on. Like eventually, like you think you're, like I, my, my anger, I'm, Mike told me I could be angry. But it's unrighteous anger. You're over there throwing tools and knocking stuff around. And, but Mike told me I could be angry. Don't put that on me. I'm like, don't you put that on me, Ricky Bobby. Don't you do that. You need to read the scripture. You better not be doing unrighteous anger because eventually it will become wrath. And you'll think that you can get away with wrath whenever you want. And God will deal with that. 
Well, that concludes today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light Radio. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to submit a prayer request or get in contact with us to find out service times, you can do all of that at our website, uh, as well as get uh, our podcast at Spotify, Audible, TuneIn Radio, pretty much wherever you can find a podcast. Uh, you, you can just type in Sun, Salt, and Light, and you'll find it. 